discipleship. We're going to look at the message of discipleship. What is it that discipleship says? What is it that discipleship shows? And then we're going to look at the definition of discipleship because we want to know what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, so we have to know what the word disciple means. So we'll talk about the definition of discipleship. And then we will walk through this text and talk about the cause that Jesus outlines here. And finally, we will end with the reward of discipleship. The reward of discipleship. So first, what is the message of discipleship? What is it that discipleship says? See, because if we jump into this text right away and treat this as a checklist of things that we have to do, we're going to miss something really important for me. The message of discipleship, what discipleship says to the world, is that Jesus Christ is worthy. That's the message that the discipleship says. That's the overall message of the Bible about this, that Jesus Christ is worthy. He is worthy for us to follow him in this kind of absolute way. Family, possessions, our lives, we tend to exalt these things, don't we? We tend to try to, we tend to make these things ultimate in our lives. And another commercial example, New York Life, an insurance company, the tagline on one of their commercials is, know what you live for. Know what you live for. And all throughout this commercial, there are images of family. Know what you live for. Here's the images of family. Here's what you're living for. This is where you need to invest your money because you need to protect your family because that is what you live for. See, we've made, we've made family ultimate. We've made ourselves ultimate. We've made our things ultimate. But Jesus Christ is to be the only ultimate in our lives. That's what discipleship says. He is the only ultimate in our lives. And let's step back and think about this for a minute. Who is the only person who is worthy of this? Who is the only person who can say, no, 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 you have to choose me over absolutely everything that you have? Who is the only being in the entire universe who is worthy of that level of allegiance and commitment? It's only God. It's only God. And yet Jesus Christ is here claiming this level of allegiance to him, as he's been pointing out. It's, it's only God. This shows his worthiness. This shows his deity. Dutch theologian who lived at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, Abraham Kuyper, said, There is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, MINE! Not one square inch. Everything in our lives, from things as important as the job we do, to things as, as trivial as the kind of shoes that we wear, Christ is the sovereign Lord over all of it. And that is the message of discipleship. And this is what distinguishes Jesus from other religious leaders, isn't it? This is what distinguishes Jesus from the cult leader. See, because the cult leader also wants this level of allegiance from you, doesn't he? He invites you. He says, hey, I've got a band on that. You can go follow me right now. We'll go get it. You can leave your family behind, leave your job behind, leave your personal preferences behind, and come and follow me. And some of us might approach this text and say, well, what is the difference between Jesus' message and the cult leader's message? Well, the main difference is the cult leader is lying to you. The cult leader is not teaching you the truth. Jesus Christ himself is the truth. But another fundamental difference is this. The cult leader is not worthy. He is not worthy of this level of commitment. But Jesus Christ is. So when Jesus asks us to hate our family, to hate ourselves, to hate everything that we have, he is not asking us to do something that he doesn't deserve. He's not asking us to do something that he doesn't deserve. So let's talk.
talk about spring boot, what is discipleship? What do we mean when we talk about discipleship? It's a word that gets thrown around in Christian circles a lot. We hear it, we think we understand it, but if we had to actually put words to what it meant, uh, maybe some of us would draw a First century rabbis would collect around themselves followers, uh, students, so to speak. And these followers would travel with them, uh, learn from them, they would imitate their life, they would imitate their teaching, they would watch how they interacted with other people, they would memorize, there's been a lot of work done recently uh, on this memorizing aspect in first century Judaism, they would memorize their master's teaching, and they would transmit that teaching later on in their master's name. My master said such and such. Actually, my master, who was so and so, said such and such. So in a very real sense, I think that what we can say is that discipleship means becoming like Jesus. I think that if we had to boil it down to uh, the core essential, we would say that discipleship is becoming like Jesus. A disciple models his master, doesn't he? A disciple models his master. And now we can begin to appreciate the necessity of what Jesus is talking about here. Because Jesus says, you can't be my disciple unless you pick up your cross and follow me. Why is that? What's going on here in the context of Luke's gospel? It said, no, great crowds accompany him. Accompany him where? Where is Jesus going? If you flip back to Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says that Jesus set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem. And what's going to happen there? He's been telling his disciples, when I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be beaten, and I'm going to be crucified. It's the cross. The cross is what's going to happen in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus is going. And so Jesus is saying uh, to these people who are following him, look, you want to model me? You want to be like me? Guess what? Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to the cross. I'm going to the cross. If you want to be like me, you've got to go to the cross. Some of us want to say, oh yeah, I want to follow Jesus. But I don't want to suffer. I don't want to suffer. Now that cross thing, let's, let's just bracket that out. That was a great thing that Jesus did. That was a great example of love. That's not for me. I want to follow Jesus. I, you know, I don't want to be obedient to everything he says. I just like some of the things he said about loving people and being nice and being kind. And, you know, all that's fine and dandy. So I'll follow Jesus in that way. If this is our understanding of discipleship, in what sense are we like? The worthiness of Jesus, 
This is a reasonable request for him that we abandon all to follow him because he's worthy of it. And the cross. The cross. That we are modeling after Jesus. And this is what it meant for him to be Messiah. So let's now look at this text. Let's look at what it says about the cost of discipleship. We've talked about the great crowds that were accompanying him. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem as a pilgrim, as a Passover pilgrim. That's what time of year it was. It was the time of year when people would go up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And what was the Passover? The Passover was a feast that Israel would hold every year to commemorate the mighty act of God in delivering the nation from slavery to Egypt. Jesus' ministry has gained momentum. Here people are saying, here is this incredible new rabbi. He's been teaching and preaching and he can even do these miraculous things. He can heal people. He can even raise the dead. Maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the one. And I don't think that it would have been too much of a stretch in the mind of some of these first century Jews to wonder as Passover approached, maybe, just maybe, if Jesus is the Messiah, there's going to be another Exodus. Maybe this would be appropriate for God to act in this way, that right now, during this holiday, that celebrates our liberation from Egypt, that the Messiah would come and liberate us from Rome. This is how people are thinking about messiahship in the first century. And Jesus is going to radically overturn this. Maybe some of these people who are voting Jesus think that they're in. They think, yeah, we're following Christ. We want to be a part of it. The Messianic kingdom is here. And Jesus turns to them. And here's what he says. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. We cannot be a disciple. So the first thing that Jesus tells us about the cost of discipleship is that if you want to follow him, you have to choose him over your family. If you want to follow him, you have to choose him over your family. So we read these verses and we say, hating, hating, that's, that's really strong language that's used here. And I don't quite understand what's going on there, right? We might look at that and say, well, what's going on here? I thought that the Ten Commandments told me that I'm supposed to honor my mother and father. But here Jesus told me that I'm supposed to hate my parents. And it doesn't Paul tell us later on in Ephesians 5 that we're supposed to love our lives. Right, guys? Isn't that something that gets drilled into us from the pulpit? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And here Jesus says, no, 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 you have to hate your wife. Is the Bible telling us to do two different contradictory things? Some of us may think, you know, I, I've got this down. I can love my wife and hate my wife all in the same moment. <laughs> That's not what Jesus is talking about. <laughs> the Bible's not contradicting itself. Is this talking about negative feelings? Towards them, that somehow you say, Oh man, my parents, you know, boy, let me tell you. As so if somehow that attitude is fulfilling Jesus' requirement to be his disciple here. You know, it's not about a negative feeling, it's about abusiveness. That Jesus is saying, Calling all white beaters. You want to be my disciple? Here's what you got to do. You've got to physically abuse your wife. No, no, far, far, far from Jesus' meaning here. Now, this is the language of choosing. This is the language of choosing. The Bible uses this kind of language also. You might recall in the Old Testament, it says, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Now, does that mean that God liked Jacob more than he liked Esau? God has some sort of a negative emotional aversion to Esau? That's not what it means. It means God chose Esau. Or, no, not Esau. God chose Jacob. God chose Jacob over Esau. It is through Jacob that the promised people are going to come. Not through Esau. Jacob have I loved. Jacob have I chosen. This is the language of choosing. This is the language of priority. This is the language of 
fundamental allegiance? Where does your fundamental allegiance lie? What this means practically is that your family comes second to Christ. Your family comes second to Christ. So what might this look like in practice? Well, sometimes it might mean literally leading home. I hope that there are people here that the Lord calls a mission one day. That's going to involve a leader in a very literal and tangible way. And this is true in Jesus' ministry, too. Someone comes to him and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus warns him, I don't have a place to sleep. Another guy comes to him and says, Lord, let me go bury my father first. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. Another guy just wants to say goodbye to the people at his house. And Jesus says, you put your hand in the cloud. And you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. This would be like trying to drive down the road, only looking in the rear view mirror. What's going to happen? It's not going to be pretty. And it's not going to be pretty for really soon. So this was true in Jesus' ministry. And it might be in the case for some of us today. God might be calling you to lead your family to go do what he's calling you to do. It may mean conflict. It may mean conflict in your family. See, families sense a fundamental shift in allegiance, don't they? Your family might know, and especially if you're not followers of Christ, this can create friction, this can create tension. And in fact, Jesus warns a little bit later in the Gospel, or a little bit earlier in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke 12, and starting in verse 51, he says, Do you think that I've come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against mother, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You get the picture. <laughs> All of these family relationships. They're comes a division there when there's a difference of fundamental allegiance. And Christ might not call you to literally be your family. And you're saying you might be Christian, so there might not be any conflict. But this always means, this always means a willingness, a leading of a family in our hearts. It always means that. And it's actually Good. It is good for your family for you to put Christ first. It is good for your family for you to put Christ first. Think about this in your relationship with your children, right? Maybe when you have kids, you're tempted to, to coddle them and to cater to them, right? And we think that that's showing love to them. But what would choosing Christ over your children in that situation look like? You discipline them. You raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And in the long run, if you're choosing Jesus over gratifying the instant desires of your children, that's going to be a good thing for them, isn't it? It is a good thing for you to put Christ over your family. It is good for you, and ultimately, it is the best thing for them as well. Now, there is sometimes a question that gets thrown around in seminary circles about what comes first. Family or ministry? What comes first? Family or ministry? And I just want to briefly speak to that. I think that our text touches on it. I think that once we set the problem up in that way, family or ministry, that we've already gone off the road. That we're already asking the wrong question. See, because I think that your ministry, seminary students, your ministry is part of everything that you have here, isn't it? Doesn't Jesus say later on in verse 33, you have to renounce all that you have. Your ministry is part of that. So we can't set this up as a dichotomy between what's greater, family or ministry. Rather, the Bible speaks to this issue, I believe, by telling us that Christ comes first. What comes first, family or ministry? Neither. Christ comes first. And in practice, what that's going to mean is that sometimes you're going to have to choose your family over your ministry. And sometimes you're going to have to choose your ministry over your family. And we need to be pleading with God to give us wisdom to know the difference. 
Number two, if it's easy infomercial, we might say, but wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. Jesus says, yes. And even his own life. Yes, and even his own life. If you want to follow Jesus, you must choose him over yourself. And again, we can have a misunderstanding you know, We might say, you know what, okay, this is fine. I actually, I got this done because I hate my life. I hate the job that I work. I hate the car that I drive. I hate the goldfish sitting in my living room. I hate all of it. I want to run away to Mexico and spend the rest of my life on the beach. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. In fact, if you feel that way about your life, it's actually because you love your life. In the sense that Jesus is speaking here because you want it to be good. You want your life to be good, don't you? And so when circumstances threaten that, then there's a problem. <laughs> no, Jesus is not talking about hatred of circumstances. He's not using life in that sense, but he's talking about a complete abandonment of yourself. A complete abandonment of yourself. And he uses here the metaphor of crucifixion. This was a Roman form of execution. We forget that in all of its religious trappings these days, don't we? This would be like Jesus saying, if you want to be my disciple, you have to sit down in your electric chair. If you want to be my disciple, you've got to take the lethal injection and put it in your arm. If you want to be my disciple, you've got to place that noose around your neck. Crucifixion was a horrible way to die. It involved shame, nakedness, extraordinary suffering. Our English word excruciating literally means out of the cross. X, you know, X out of, cruci, cross. Excruciating. This is a form of pain that comes out of the cross. It's so bad. So what does Jesus mean here? He means you have to die. You have to die to yourself. You have to follow me. If you want to become like me, because I'm going to die, you have to die to yourself as well. And what might this look like practically? Well, it means that your life is totally in Jesus' hands. Totally in Jesus' hands. It means that you're killing sin in your life. Killing sin in your life. You're putting it to death. It means that you may actually die doing what Jesus calls you to do. This is a distinct possibility for all of us as Christians. That the Lord Jesus Christ would call us to something that in the end would ultimately cost us our lives. And even if that's not the case, it means that we ought to be willing to die to do what he wants us to do. But again, there's more. There's more. Skipping to verse 33, Jesus says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. All that he has. If you want to follow Jesus, you must choose him over everything. You must choose him over everything. We think immediately of possessions when we hear this kind of language, but we can certainly extend this everything to friends, career, reputation, influence, plans, hopes, dreams, agendas, everything. We can ask ourselves a question. What does this look like when I leave? When I leave here today, does this mean that I have to go sell everything that I have? Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. There was a man who's going to come to Jesus later on in Luke's gospel. And he's going to say, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? And Jesus says, sell. What do you do now? Give a little more. And come follow me. So sometimes, yeah. This is an intentionally provocative statement by Christ. And we don't want to water it down. We don't want to water it down. Now usually, usually that's not the case. Most Christians, Christ does not call to literally give away all of their possessions. But it does mean that absolutely everything in your life is now oriented to 
towards serving Jesus. R.T. Prince, a New Testament scholar, R.T. Prince, has a great example of this in his commentary on Mark. He points out that, look, the disciples have left everything to follow Jesus, but they still have their boats. Right? Christ is in the boat with the disciples, and it's the disciples' boats. But now, they are using their boats for the kingdom. So all of our possessions, all of our influence, all of our plans, all of our thinking needs to be oriented towards how we are served Jesus Christ with this. And so we can ask ourselves, are there possessions or things in our lives that we simply consider to be our own? No God, no God. God, I'm not serving you over here with this, but this is mine. Other possessions in our life like that. Is there anything, is there any possession or thing that we hold on to so tightly so that if the Lord were to ask us to give that up, we would not be willing to? These are the questions of discipleship. And these are hard, hard questions. So that's the cause. Jesus is not asking us to do something that's cheap. He's not asking us to do something that's cheap. This is very costly. Now Jesus tells two parables of the same to back this up. The first is the parable of the tower. He says, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And this doesn't just happen in the first century. This happens today, too. Uh, you may have heard of the superconducting super collider that they were going to build in Texas. Maybe probably not. I didn't know that until I went to It was just this nickname that the Desert Tron, and they like to get cool names like that. Uh, this thing was a very large project. There is a what's called a large hadron collider in Geneva, and the superconducting super collider was going to be about three times the amount of energy output as the large hadron collider. And they did count the cost. They counted the cost and they proposed a budget to Congress, $4.4 billion. And then as they began to construct, they realized that this is not a four and a half billion dollar project. This is going to be closer to $12 billion. Congress canceled the project. Fortunately, they had only spent $2 billion of their money on it. <laughs> so now, as part of that, that partially completed super collider in Texas, was bought by a chemical company. And it's no longer the great monument to American physics that would have been. Jesus said, make sure you know how much it costs to follow me. Don't end up. Don't end up like a super conductor. The second parable is the parable of a king facing a battle. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. The king decides, I want to go to war, and realizes, you know what, I, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. We need to make peace. The point of these parables, again, is know what you're getting into. And the saying about salt follows the same pattern, right? In, in the first parable, you have a guy who starts and can't finish. In the second parable, you've got a king who's considered going to war, and he says, I'm not going to do that. And then here, we have the saying about salt losing its taste. So you have salt, and it's salty, and then it loses its taste, and then, then what do you use it for? Then it's not good enough. That's the cost. A good example of this, I heard this quote of this week and I thought that it was providential and someone used it this morning. Jonathan Edwards, a pastor in New England in the 18th century, wrote a personal narrative where he reflects on some of these things in his life. And he writes on January 12, 1723, I made a solemn dedication of myself to God and wrote it down. Giving up myself and all that I have to God, to be for the future, in no respect my own, 
to act as one that had no right to himself in any respect, and solemnly vowed to take God for my whole portion and felicity. Felicity means joyousness. Not right, I had to look it up. Looking on nothing else as any part of my happiness, nor acting as if it were, and his law for the constant rule of my obedience, engaging to fight with all my might against the world, the flesh, and the devil to the end of my life. And this attitude is an example of discipleship. But you know, it's actually impossible for us to do this um, really fully and, and truly from our hearts. The next line, in Edward's narrative, as he reflects back on his vow that he made some years earlier, he says, But I have reason to be infinitely humble when I consider how much I have failed of answering my obligation. Discipleship is costly and discipleship is hard. Actually, discipleship is impossible. It's impossible. Even for us to come to Christ in the first place, in salvation is impossible. In Mark chapter 10, when it recounts the story of this man that comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, we'll give everything away, and it begins to dawn on the disciples how hard this is. They say, who can be saved? And Jesus has an interesting response. He says, man, this is impossible. Because you can't be. You can't be saved. And maybe we begin to understand a little bit more now why in John chapter 6, Jesus says, no one can come to me. Did you know that Jesus said that? I had my sister-in-law ask me one time, can anyone come to Jesus? And again, just trying to be intentionally provided, and I said, no. In fact, Jesus said, no one can come to him. Nobody can come to him. Nobody can come to this Christ. But I know it. The bully in Mark 10, in John 6, Jesus adds something really important. In Mark 10, he says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With God, <laughs> and in John six, he doesn't just leave it there. With no one can come to me. That would be that would be a tragedy, wouldn't it? He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent him, who sent me, draws. God brings people. So if you're sitting here this morning and you have followed Christ and we talk about the cross and we talk about the cost of discipleship and you look at your life and you go, you know what, boy, my attitude is not like God remembers. I feel like there are so many things in my life that I have set as a priority over Jesus Christ. I'm trusting in him for my salvation, but there are so many things in my life that need to come into line and I just don't know how I'm going to do it. I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you this morning because if you are even believing in Jesus, God has already done an impossible thing in your heart. You would not have come to Christ in the first place if God had not worked sovereignly to bring you to sin and faith. And what that means is that God is going to continue to work. It is the destiny of every Christian to be conformed perfectly to the image of Christ. Paul continues to say this. We quoted a little bit of Philippians 3 earlier. Verse 11 says that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Paul, like Jonathan Edwards, is saying, look, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. So if you feel like you're not there yet, you know, you're in good company. You're in good company. Christ has not asked us to do something that he does not provide the power to do. Last point, because our time is gone. The reward of discipleship. We open this with an analogy with pharmaceutical corporations. We open it with an analogy. That analogy breaks down at exactly this point because these drugs can cause side effects that are worse than what you're trying to solve sometimes. Right? But that's never going to be the case with following Jesus. There's another side of becoming like Christ, isn't there? 
The other side of suffering and the cross is glory. The hymn we sang last week by Charles Wesley, Christ the Lord is risen today, says, so are we now, where Christ is led. Following our exalted heaven, made like him, like him we rise. Ours, the cross, the grave, the skies. Jesus is not asking us to do anything that is not worth it. So let's conclude. I don't know if you've ever received an invitation in the mail. My wife and I received an invitation this week. It was to a fundraiser. And you know that that's going to cost something because it's a fundraiser. So you've got to pay to get in and you've got to take out your checkbook while you're there. Uh, but the invitation is going to talk about all of the great things. Here's why you should come. Look, you should come and support our ministry. You should come because we're going to have this great meal. We're going to have this awesome speaker. And the invitation to the discipleship of the Bible is certainly like that. Come to me, Jesus said. Come to me, have eternal life. How great blessed is Come to me, learn from me. I'm gentle and humble. You'll find rest for your souls. There's a benefit. There's an incredible benefit to follow the rest. Our text today has sort of been like a not so fine print on the invitation to the subject. How would this be for an invitation? Come, come follow me. You've got to choose to over absolutely everything. You have to give up your wants, your preferences, and your desires. You may very well face persecution, suffering, and yes, even death. How's that for an invitation to discipleship? This is what Jesus tells the crowds, though. This is what he tells them. This is his warning. But when we think about this, when we think about the gravity of this, And when I say next, those of you who know me know that I choose these words very carefully. Because I don't take votes. I don't take votes. But when we think about this, I swear to you, based on the faithfulness of God, that it's going to be worth it. If there's anyone here this morning who has ears, to hear by him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are worthy of the great cause that you ask of us. And we humbly pray that you would give us the strength to follow you. I pray that if there is anyone here today who has not entered into a discipleship relationship with you, that you would solidly move in, in their heart. You would do that in their heart. And I pray, Lord God, today, for those of us who have entered into a discipleship relationship with you, that you would continue to make us more and more like Jesus. Because you promised in your word that we are predestined to be one with you.